Hi, I'm Seamless, and this is part two of the making of Ruin, where we talk about the sound design. If you're curious as to why I haven't had a camera up for a while, it's because I have it in a very specific position for the uh, current track from scratch on my live stream, and I don't want to change it around between Monday and Wednesday. Uh, anyway, sound design, all that good stuff. Just a reminder that you can actually pick up this project for yourself uh, at the Fix store, along with every other project from the EP that I just put out, the Wizard Base EP. You can definitely buy individual projects if you don't like particular other projects. However, if you buy them all at once, you do get a particular discount. So, handy stuff. Anyway, uh, let's talk about sound design. So, in the very beginning, we have this guy. Which is just this guy. Or is it Electro Drop? What's it called? That's what it's called. Just that put through an incredible amount of time stretching, you can see up here. Also pitched up and all that other good stuff. And then uh, I have a Fruity Revolver out here with a dry halfway down, the wet halfway up, which makes it so that it's really both just reverb. And this over here is the EQ, which is making it uh, only be a couple of specific parts on it, which is giving it a, that vaguely formative quality into higher frequencies. Vaguely. It mostly sounds, still sounds like that anyway. But then with the reverb. It's really quite interesting. And it makes for a nice kind of background weird sound. I didn't really plan on making it sound like that. It just kind of occurred. And actually, I want to tell you, a lot of the times people will actually will ask me, like primarily as, their, as the thing they want to ask me, how can I get to the point where I can make the sound that's in my head? And... You can get to that point, and I certainly have tried, but largely when I'm making sounds and songs that I'm using, I'm not planning any of that. I'm just kind of doing stuff until stuff sounds okay or awesome, which is often the case with a giant accident, but those are the best accidents. And it's kind of, even this track, a lot of the sounds that are in here, are either sounds that I already made for something else or were just fully accidents. Like this sound was fully an accident. And then immediately after that, we have these chords. which are later messed around with, with this a bloop. Add that, there it is. As I mentioned in the uh, arrangement, arrangement video about how this sort of, I have, a, I have one plug-in in a patch or accident kind of thing. This The reason why I do that is because I, I usually plan on making more kind of intense thing, so I start it inside a patcher. However, you don't actually need to do that, as something I didn't quite realize in the early days. You can actually make something separate uh, outside of patcher, and then if you decide that, okay, now I want to put a whole bunch of effects on it, then you can actually just drag and drop patcher onto this, and it'll make a patcher with that in there. So, because the reason why I, I, I put it in a patcher is, is because I'm thinking to myself, well, what if I need to have crazy bass, and I don't want to have to, like, save the preset and load in the patcher, that kind of crap. Turns out there's already a method to do that without you having to do that, because they thought of that. As for this thing itself, it is mostly just a super saw. Um, there might be something... Oh, yeah, so I, actually I have uh, the phaser engaged in the frequency mode, which if you dragged it all the way down, you have these two special modes. You have a custom shape mode where you can do your own shape, and then you have the frequency mode, which also uses its own shape, but... The phaser usually applies the modulation to the volume of the individual harmonics. And in the frequency mode, it applies that modulation to pitch. Which is actually what's causing all this shenanigans. And the reason this is working at all is because I'm using the phaser mask to have this pretty much only occur... Um, up here and down here, and I'm playing a high enough note that it's not really interacting with it. But you can see that if I go down lower, it gets real, real kind of funky, according to the mask. And inside Harmony, there are various masks which essentially uh, decrease or increase the Im impact of particular particular uh, functions on the on the harmonics motion. There's also a classic bandpass, which is the main animation that we're using here. It's the one thing that's being activated. Over, over there, and that's what's being automated inside the uh, the playlist over here. Just a bandpass filter. Lots of voices, lots of saws, and I have the I 
had the prism changed, but I'm not doing anything with it. Uh, fun fact, if you look at the drop down menu of Harmer, the things that you have changed have a little arrow on it to indicate that you changed them, which is good to, to determine what the hell someone did with the preset or something like that. And um, even if you're not actually using the thing, like, for example, here's the prism, it's off, it's been off the whole time, it's not on, I, it's, it's still the fact that I changed it, it still shows up like that. Just regular units, and I didn't change anything to do with the harmonic unit pitch, which, which, which we can tell because there's no arrow there. And that's pretty much all there is this sound. Delayed reverb and some chorus and a lot of uh, compression just to bring that up. And then in post, pretty sure I have like an EQ on it or something. Yeah, I brought it down pretty far. Pretty basic, just mixing stuff. I mean, it looks rather intense, and that's just because it um, needed to be cut down quite a bit. Mostly because of that bad pass. The higher frequencies get a little wild. Uh, and then the next thing that we hear is the flub. Ha. Ah. So I actually have this reverb here, which is labeled in case you don't have Valhalla Shimmer, because this is using Valhalla Shimmer. Which is full on not comparable, but if you don't have Valhalla Shimmer, you want to have at least some reverb, because if you don't, it sounds kind of dumb by itself. Um, this sound has a bunch of bunch of voices in unison and the phase all the way up. And when the phase is all the way up, it actually engages a little bit of phase randomness every time uh, you play the note, almost like you're using the spectral randomness of the knob up here, but it, it just kind of is a little bit special. I have a detune to two, which is like having it on the square mode. It, it is creating square frequencies. Ah, pardon me, square harmonics, rather. Uh, and the phaser is engaged, but the phaser, as you can see, it's just, it's just real basic stuff. It's not, I'm not doing anything kind of crazy with it. It's actually going pretty normal there. But I do have automation on something. Probably the band pass. Is that what that is? Yeah. Over here. Flip. Flub auto envelope. Yep, moving to band pass. And that's what's causing this to be a thing. It's not really, again, not much complication involved in this in this particular sound. These this, The sounds that I tend to make for things that are intros are oftentimes the sounds that I care the least about. Usually because um, if they aren't, if, like, if I do care about them, it's because they're actually from the drop, and I put them in there so that they kind of relate to the intro. But as far as like sort of the ambient and whatever sounds, like I, it's, I find it easier just to care less about them, not because I think they're not important or that I don't want to care about them, but because then I come up with more interesting things by not trying so hard. And this is one of those examples. In Valhalla Shimmer, tiny, tiny Valhalla Shimmer, um... Doing anything useful? I do have the shift engaged and I have the feedback engaged. So the shimmer is the shimmer is a neat a neat thing. It's referred to as a bucket brigade reverb, which you may have re heard the term bucket brigade the delay before. I'm not 100 percent sure on what the process is, is on that, but what the the difference between Valhalla shimmer and sort of regular reverb is that you can control um, there's there's a sort a, a feedback option and a shift option, and he's controlled essentially the pitch. Of the output reverb, uh, there's also like you know the mod modulation and stuff like that. And there's also th that pitch mod is also available in something, something like Valhalla Room, which is a more regular reverb. But this is a, this is extreme. What happens when you use the uh, the shift function? That's what happens. You might be thinking that that movement is being caused by the, the flanger. While the flanger is adding to that, when I hit a, s a small note like that, and we hear it kind of like keep going up like that, that's from the shift. And usually I keep it pretty high or pretty low. You can go up or you can go down. In this case, I'm going up, but not by a lot. Only like, and this, is, this is semitone, so five semitones. Uh, still a little bit sick. So yeah, that's neat about Valhalla Shimmer. I use it sparingly because it is a very kind of out of control reverb like most Bucket Brigade things are. The next thing that shows up is these chords, which I muted. Bam! Am I doing anything in the post in the flub? Yeah, I'm just high-passing it. 
no, no, interesting there. Smap. Most these guys. So this is using Valhalla Room, which is just a really solid reverb. It does, it doesn't really do a whole lot of stuff differently. It just sounds pretty great by itself out of the box. You could add, get pretty comparable results using regular stuff. It's just that I find it easier to use this to do to get to where I want to be. I also have a replacement. Just in case you don't have the actual plugin. Pretty standard super saw kind of thing. I'm pretty sure I have a an envelope engaged on the uh, filter. Nope, I don't. What's causing the pluck on this then? Is it actual pluck? Or is it just like static? Nope, there's a plug somewhere. But where? On oh, that volume. Of course it is. So there's a plug on the volume and also some weirdness on the harmonic unison, which is why the unison sounds a little bit weird. That kind of weird like hissing sound is mostly coming from the unison doing what it's doing and the phase cancellation happening in an irregular way because we've messed with it. If you're unfamiliar with what this window does, when you have the unison, you have this pitch control, which controls how deep essentially the pitch difference between all the voices is. This window controls how deep the pitch difference between all the voices is per harmonic. Each of these bars represents one octave's worth of harmonics, which if you're not, if you don't know about that, the um, each octave has twice as many harmonics as the one previous previous to it, to the point where the last octave has half of all harmonics of all, of the entire series. Which, like, if you wanted to add an extra octave of harmonics, you'd have to add twice as much of like this, this whole thing again, which is pretty intense. So uh, these these little bars represent that, just not. Just distributed even according to octaves as opposed to include uh, even according to the individual harmonics so this shape is saying that all right these these guys have increasingly more unison than increasingly less unison increasingly more unison not so much unison regular unison kind of thing and that creates extremely strange phase cancellation because normally all of these things all have the same amount of pitch difference which are controlled for based on pitch and uh or rather note and if you screw with that it changes the profile pretty dramatically. And so that's why it sounds like at least a tiny bit unique because everything else that's happening here is rather p pedestrian, if you want to say. As you can see, I did attempt to do something with the pluck and everything worked out so well, so then I just did it with the volume and that worked out fine. Lots of, uh, a little, little bit of distortion happening. Neat. A little bit of reverb. Oh, a lot of it reverb, reverb actually. <laughs> And compression. Mm. And then, you know, the EQ. I was going to mention something about... Something about volume. A puck. There was totally a thing I was going to mention that made sense. That was important. Oh, yeah. Vlog. So, um, there's various distortion types in here. And most of these are sourced from the Wave Shaper in NFL. Some of them. Not all of them. And there's a little bit of the, the asymmetrical sort of stuff is a control that you don't really have inside the wave shaper. But um, the reason why I like using logs so much inside Harmer is because in, you might see me use the wave shaper and then log distortion is just this. And I, I do this, this is like my go to kind of distortion on anything. Whenever I'm like, I need to distort something, I just do this. And the log is short for logarithmic because you could have exponential, which is this, and then you have logarithmic, which is this. So that's, um, that's what's up with that. And I gotta go remove that uh, distortion because I put it, I put it on a master whenever I just tell it to put things places without specifying. Yeah, and the Valhalla room, you know, is is per huge, and then a little bit of EQ to kind of temper temper some things. Mostly just to get the mids to behave. Intro sounds, and now we get to the actual derp. Sudden side chaining. Good times. The very first bass is this guy. A rather run-of-the-mill 
Reese kind of sound, but we'll go over sort of what 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 does for what what happens here. I might notice that I have like you know a whole bunch of EQs in here, and then I EQ in post. And why would I do that? And the reason why I do that is because I like to separate what I consider to be sound design equalization and mixing equalization. Sound design equalization it can be really just kind of whatever, and you, can't, you see I'm doing, I'm doing a little bit of this anyway. But um, the, the purpose of this, of sound design, anything like compression, distortion, EQ, whatever, are are that you really want the sound to sound as awesome as possible by itself. And then mixing equalization is about the sound sounding awesome as possible with other stuff. Usually, the goal is to make everything sound as awesome as they did by themselves with other things, which requires a lot of uh, finesse in your equalization. So different decisions are handy to keep separate. And not only that, but now I can have all this, all the sound design stuff inside the generator, and then all the mixing stuff in the mixer. So it's, it's able to like compartmentalize things in a way that's a lot of fun. So let's actually turn off this extra EQ up here, and we'll go over what this what this sounds like, bit by bit. So the original bit here is this uh, Citrus, which ain't doing a lot. And actually, this configuration will become uh, familiar when we talk about some, one of the other bases. So just kind of remember what this looks like. But what's happening is that there's this um, this triangle with extra harmonics FMing uh, sine wave, which typically I actually used to use this as a way to make a, a pretty standard growl bass. And then that's being uh, FM'd by this uh, sort of distorted sine wave shape which is being tensioned against itself. So like you normally, this is distortion, and then this, this is sort of, this would be logarithmic distortion, and this would be exponential distortion. That's what that looks like. And it's also one octave higher than the fundamental tone. So this creates some kind of square-ish type harmonics, but because this this one is fundamental tone, and if I'm aiming this fundamental tone, we get also also the uh, square types, or saw types. Also because of the fact that we have a, like a saw just coming out of here. Now, this, uh, when it's by itself like this, it doesn't actually feel like it's being all that much of a Reese. And what's happening is that there's this sine wave down here, which is uh, slightly off pitch from everything else. The saw wave and the FM shenanigans are all together, and then this guy is uh, a little bit different. If you pay real close attention, you can hear the motion, but it's not really that apparent until you distort it. where the difference in level caused by the fact that this phase cancellation starts to uh, push different harmonics up and down in various ways. Then we put it through a giant big old notch and a little bit of a high pass to give it that, that kind of old school drum and bass feel, which is full of big old notches at 500 hertz. Sometimes not necessarily notches, but just you know big dips like we did in the actual uh, the mixing EQ. But a notch is just fine for me as well. Add flanger, which is real subtly just kind of adding additional motion. And I wasn't really paying attention to why I used what settings at what point. I did keep the feedback low. That was one thing I did on purpose because the higher feedback makes it kind of ring up a little bit. And I just wanted this, this to be just a teensy bit subtle. Into an EQ that's, uh, you, as you can see, isn't really doing a lot. And when we listen to it at the EQ stage, I might be thinking, why Why did I even do that with the EQ? And that's because these are decisions I did not make with the sound as it is now. I made it after this point. When I distorted it again. And these decisions suddenly start to make more sense. Putting an equalizer before heavy distortion is one of the easier ways to shape the sound and solve a lot of problems than if you tried to solve it in post after the distortion. Much, uh, the, the easy, the simplest exa example of this is what happens when it, we, we bring uh, this down lower and bring the lower harmonics down where this, the higher harmonics are suddenly being distorted a lot, a lot uh, as they're the main focus of the, of the distortion at that point. But also we can bring up, the, bring up the lower frequencies and kind of round out the sound more. And in this case, I just kind of want a nice little happy medium and just slight touches. And then, Mixing EQ on top, because it did it like that last distortion did bring back all the mids that we got rid of from the original the original notch. We want that to kind of just be there the way it is, and that's that sound. And in the MIDI, I just kind of bring it down. With that it's mostly being cut off by the kick anyway because of the, how hard it is, but that works out. The next sound that we hear is this guy, bass number four. 
Now, this sound is sweet as hell. Um, I didn't actually make it in this project. This sound was created in, in a uh, bass gorilla track, actually. And I liked it so much that I wanted to use it in a drum and bass track because it was just so good. So remember when I talked about that we were going to be familiar with this particular, particular configuration? And look, here it is. It's that triangle thing again. And uh, this is slightly different. Um, this is actually, as you can see, it's actually higher pitched. It's, it's at the same four, you know, as this guy. And this guy is actually the same kind of exponential tension on here, but it's a, a closer to a triangle than anything else. Um, actually, it's almost, it looks like it's almost a saw wave. It's a slightly past triangle. And uh, I believe this, yeah, so this is being automated. So we have. <laughs> And that's the sound that these two things create together. A little bit of chorus to add stereo, like without it, it's just not very stereo. Again, not a lot doing it here, just kind of has some stereo. And then the keep, I keep the delay and the depth low when I am trying to sort of use it as a stereoizer. And then I have the cross cut off really low. And this, this is a uh, high pass mode. You can tell you can tell it to be high pass or low pass. And uh, this is in high pass mode? Huh. So this means that like I'm I'm doing everything but the lowest frequencies, which is really you know smart when we're talking about stereo anyway. Talking to get monitored, and then this all goes into some strange distortion. And like this was me just kind of doing stuff until it sounded all right. I wasn't really paying attention or even planning what this was or why, and uh, it ended up working out nicely. And then we have a sub on top of that just to kind of even out the sound because the sound definitely needs evening out. Although now that I think about it. That was a waste of time because I'm totally uh, separate something all this anyway. But um, on top of that, we have another one of these big old 500 hertz pushes. And another chorus on top to add just a teensy bit more motion to it all. Teensy is the name of the game there. Very, very subtle in its, in its use. The automation is usually pretty fast. And rather standard for that for that matter. But it's got it's got that nice tone that reminds me of like a reversed snare sound almost. The next sound is just that first bass again. And then we have this guy, which is probably the more interesting one of all all all, all, all what's going on. Good times. So let's go on a post here. Uh, more than one EQ for some reason? Oh, yeah, because I, I high pass it at some point. You see, these are turned off and turned on again. It's because I, I, I use, the, use, the, use these as, like, uh, fill effects on various parts of it. Um, but this is the actual mixing EQ, which, again, has the big old 500, 500 hertz. It's a giant, giant dump. So without that, that's what that sounds like. Wait, no. Base five, yeah. This guy. In the beginning, it's a citrus. It sounds weird as hell. That's because what's happening is that we have a sine wave, we have another sine wave, and this is where the reasing is coming in because there is a reese happening. Hard is the tell, but it's not being distorted. And then we have this screwed up saw wave. So I do this a lot, but what happens here is if you make a saw wave and then you go convert this shape to sine harmonics, it creates a saw wave in, as individual sine waves, which these are all, all are, and then we can screw with the phases. And this makes the sharp saw wave turn into a kind of cloudy smooth saw wave, which is what this guy is. And this is in tune with their first sine wave, and so it gets reached as well against the other sine wave. Of course, um, this is actually that other citrus that's funny. The uh, this phase cancellation actually only happens against the lowest harmonic, but because of distortion, it all gets brought out. And then after that, we have this, this EQ, which has notches, and these notches are moving. And that's what it's doing. The... It's interesting because this this motion is is actually combining with the actually just the motion from the Reese. 
which is uh, working together to create the sort of the row that we're, that we're hearing it, hearing use it. Then there's a chorus, a little bit of stereo, or a lot of stereo. Jesus. Yeah. So this is uh, mostly just like so you see the cross is all the way down, which means that it's it's all the frequencies are being chorused, and uh, the stereo is tight, but also so is the delay of depth, which means it's getting we're getting close to sort of uh, phasey. Uh, Cancellation sounding things. And a flanger, which is actually having one parameter being automated. And I believe that's a depth. Yep. So the flanger's like, position is being moved a lot, which is causing the frequencies to kind of move around a bunch. And then there's this EQ, which I'm pretty sure is not doing anything, but we can use it to look at what the uh, flanger is doing. Kinda. It's a little bit weird. And then it gets destroyed again. And that sounds weird and muddy, so we use the post EQ to bring down to 500 hertz. And the automation that we have present here is uh, the two notches and then the one flanger. And they're going against each other, which is creating that kind of vague, um, growly feel. Because normally when you have like a two, two big... Uh, like filter events like a, a giant notch and another giant notch like really forceful things you want them and you want to growl you move them against each other like they're moving in the same not the same direction you move them in the same direction you tend to get a very phasery kind of thing we actually do have a phasery kind of thing happening with the flanger and that's going in the other direction so that means that they're moving together to facilitate a little bit of the growl like a tiny teensy teensy bit because it did it would more or less sound like that without the flanger like if this just went directly to here we didn't do that <laughs> Only now it's like way too bass heavy. See what I mean about the EQ before distortion? Yeah, so that tiny bit of subtlety helps to sort of sell it, which is neat. I may have been like 100% wrong about what I was saying about the, the, the flanger and the phaser moving against each other. You can see the automation moving against each other, but that I, I might not actually mean that's what the frequencies are being moved by the, the, the flanger. It could be causing it to move the other direction for what I know at the moment, but that's my current idea. And it's not like I knew that while I was doing it. I was just kind of doing it and see like, what would happen if I did this? And then that, this, this happened, and obviously I'm going to keep that. The next new base we have is this guy. Base number two, which is fully taken from the track Glass, which was made a lot earlier in this track. This track, I mentioned in the earlier, earlier in the narration track, is still pretty old, but it's not nearly as old as Glass and uh, Back. This track, um, like the main, the point of this track was actually the uh, uh, a phaser version of this track, which ended up being in a how to bass. I don't remember what number it was, but it was called Old School Flanger Reese. So if you can go look that up, you can find out how old it actually is. But uh, even earlier than that, though, uh, this was actually made out of a 40K, I think. It might, that might not actually be true. I think it was, though. That was a long time ago. I don't know if it's that old. I have to check. But I, I could have sworn that this was a, is actually a piece of us, me, me have, trying to have done a Skrillex sound. It was... Um, <coughs> <laughs> it was Skrillex, Kill the Noise, Milo and Otis, I think, and it was a kind of a big ruby kind of plucky thing. But it had this it had this kind of typical Reesey thing behind it, and I made I made that. And I, I didn't really do a very good job with the pluck, but the Reesey thing sounded dope. So I took the Reesey thing and just kind of ran with it, being like, I'm just going to use the sound things now. And I'm pretty sure that's this. I could be wrong about that though. Anyway, let's talk about what makes it. As you can see, it's a little bit complicated. It probably didn't need to be this complicated, but it totally is. So, in the uh, on top, we have various <laughs> EQing, and without that, it's basically the same thing, but like just, uh, a little bit more papery. And that's why I have this big old cut at the higher frequencies because there are a lot of high frequencies, and then the big huge cut at 5K because Jesus. I'm just gonna leave that there. Actually, nah, that's probably not a, not a good idea. In the beginning, it was citrus. <laughs> really, really pitchy. We have a saw wave, 
and you have a busted saw wave. All right, a busted square wave. So the difference harmonically between a saw wave and square wave is what we're looking at right now. A saw wave has the full series, the full, the full just regular four-year series, and the square wave has every other one, specifically all the uh, odd-numbered ones. All the even ones are cut off as such. And this is the harmonic equivalent of a square wave. And we're doing the same thing. We, we mess with the phases, and this creates this sound. Uh, it's uh, pretty easy to move between either of these. You just make square and then do the same thing, add some, make, re recreate inside harmonics, and then it'll just be this, and it'll work. And it's putting it against a saw wave, which has um, its different pitch, but also so is this not a uh, default, rather a fundamental tone. It is a whole point one lower in the ratio than what's supposed to be two. I might even look at the right one. This is guy. Yeah, okay, so it's five down. Five up, five down. So it's a whole point away from each other. I apparently had different ideas about what was supposed to go on in this, in, in this, in this uh, situation, but we're really only using this guy. And not a, not a single thing else is happening in, in this in this stage. So there's a lot of kind of layering going on here. Actually, we have um, essentially like the sub is kind of being reintroduced after these into this uh, third distortion. Um, this first guy, haha, a little bit of folding is going on. So folding is a particular kind of uh, wave shaping that I think actually in the real world involves FM. But like what's happening is that I'm using the wave line type inside uh, the wave shaper, and that and then this just leaving it like that against a regular uh, log one. That's what this one is. So like this one by itself sounds as such. I have to sneeze. <laughs> Good times with that. Then we have the just big old mountain. I'm not really totally sure why I made that EQ like that, but that's what's happening. And then this guy. It's got some chorus involved. To do it to do its deal. And that this that that thing, and then also this sort of sub retention. It gets back added into number three here. Which now starts to sound like it's supposed to without the sub. It sounds identical. It's because I turned it down a whole bunch. I wonder why that's even there. And after this, we have uh, sort of the attempt, like the, these these two being that they're automated. Like they're, I'm not automating it at all. I'm just keeping it there. But I definitely did try to do this in the original Squillex track, which I'm pretty sure this is. And I tried to do some automation to move, move against it with some growls and whatever, but it mostly just sounded fine. Stuck at the 500 hertz range where it all, you know, does that. It's like 100% it's like responsible for making the tone at this particular moment right here. And then it gets compressed. And this is a pretty typical kind of compression for me where I just kind of go a little bit high and just upwards, upwards forever. I didn't even change the time variables. It's just just pumping it for not not a lot of reasons. Just making it big, bigger. It goes into an EQ, which goes into these two distortions, which is why this EQ exists. Because like much like I said before, this is this is, this is the EQ before the distortion, just so that we are able to control the tone going into the distortion. The distortion themselves are rather regular. Uh, and this is just kind of shapes that I made. Like this is almost just normal log distortion, and this is just just some stuff happening. And they're both being compressed independently. And then put it into another distortion. Wow. So like this guy by itself. And then this guy by itself. And then this compression. And then this compression. Pretty regular, but then combined again into the last. This is actually a pretty slight distortion. It sounds like that. I'm not 100 percent sure how wow useful this stuff was, but um This all definitely happened. Jeez. So this is actually one of the more special things you can do with Maximus here. Um, Maximus is a is a compressor that doesn't really abide by the typical um, threshold ratio stuff, because no normal compressor could ever do this. This is sort of why I refer to Maximus as being a wave shaping compressor, which is a little bit of a misnomer because I, I say that like it's a unique thing, because wave shaping and, and compression is really kind of the same. Like distortion and compression are the same process. It's just that compression has time variables. These attack, release, and the ahead and delay and whatever, all that stuff, which prevents it from distorting. If you do it right, um, I'm not totally sure we're doing it right right now. Come on, play the sound. 
There it is. So, uh, what this is saying is that, like, as the thing gets louder, it gets pulled back up, pulled back down, pulled back up, up, up again. And if we do that fast enough, that would actually result in distortion not unlike something like this. But um, because it's going it's going slow enough, uh, which is to say like, at, at the 15 millisecond range, um, it's just going to make it feel weird in the mid-range. The... Um, so the rule of thumb when it comes to the time variables is that the time variables react faster than the oscillation of the of whatever frequencies that they're compressing. They're going to they're going to distort it. And so if we're doing multiband, the low frequencies are pretty long, so you want a pretty long time variable. And the mids and the highs are faster, so you could have way faster time variables before they start to start to distort. And on the master, you kind of have this up to your discretion and sort of what your ear is telling you about how fast you want that to be. Faster compression means snappier results so especially for drums it's very important slower compression usually in, in, usually means kind of muddier not not as good sounding results depending on what you like and then on the master we put this guy to kind of rein it in and then that's that sound and then uh the next sound that we hear is this one and this is actually the same thing this is the exact same uh, Reese patch, except that on the uh, on the uh, mixer, we have, we have uh, a little bit different EQ profiles, and we have this flanger. And this flanger is set up to cause uh, that kind of old school, noisy style phase cancellation. <laughs> That's what it's set up to do. And it's doing it automatically. And this is actually not even close to how it's supposed to be done. Um, it just happens to sound pretty all right, you know, by itself. The way that it's supposed to be done is that you take, you record a sample, take the sample, put it against itself, like uh, just a clone, clone the recording of the sample, and you change the pitch extremely slightly of that other sample, and then you get that phase cancellation. Um, I mean, I knew that. The, the difference between what happens with this sound and that technique is that I tried a technique that technique before on things that I thought were perfectly fine Reese's. As it turns out, it wasn't the technique that was the problem. It was the Reese's. The This particular Reese was the first one that sounded as close to that particular style as I had ever done at the time. And so when I tried it with, with using the flanger, it just automatically sounded correct to me. And if I had done the other technique as well, it would have worked out just fine. And... Like the reason why I can confirm that this is the, the the whole sampled way is the way it was done, is as I mentioned in the previous video that a member of Evil Intent actually told me when I posted this as a how to base on Reddit, because he saw it I was like wow good job but here's how it's actually done and I was like ah thank you information I like information it's pretty great. So that's it for all the bases. Those are those just come in and out in various times and places. Hey, it rhymed. And I don't think, oh yeah, okay, so we do have some new things. So the next, the last thing that shows up in this track is this bridge bass thing. And this was a last ditch effort to make something that anything I could possibly think of to fit in between, in between, in between drops. In between drops. We have a bunch of unison, a low level amount of it, not a lot of panning and not a lot of phase, but uh, it, enough unison. We have some phase randomness, which is contributing contributing to this sort of the pillowy nature of the sound. We have the harmonic user pitch doing wildly different things, which is causing uh, as well different uh, phase cancellation kind of all around. Um, and then we have the bandpass going, but the frequency is actually being automated internally by an envelope. I'm not automating this outside. I don't believe I'm automating anything outside. Nope, just that. So that means every note is going to just kind of do this over and over again. I have the harmonizer on, and the harmonizer is before the filter. So it's just, it's just kind of there adding to the tone. And that's all being distorted. And some chorus reverb, just delay, and dis distortion, and compression, and then EQ'd with a big old bump at 500 hertz. And this sound is really not that deep. It's also a square. It's just kind of there. Yeah, so that's this project. Not a single thing else is happening. Nope, that's all up. That's up. That's it. That's everything. That's all there was. There wasn't any more. And as a reminder, if you'd like to have this project, it's actually for sale. You can go to thefixstore.com slash seamlessr. The link is in the description of this video if you don't want to type it in. And a lot of options are available. What you want is a deluxe version. And you can definitely get individual projects if you don't want to get the whole thing. Or you can get the whole thing. Either is option is great. Either is option. Either option is great. 
Uh, if you have any questions about this, please let me know. Don't forget to like, comment, subscribe, and all that good stuff. And as usual, have a nice day.